permitted to go however fast I go, uh, not to purposely speed up, uh, just because uh, I want to make things as understandable as I can. Uh, so we were talking about large N last time and the fat graph expansion. So I've drawn a few examples of vacuum diagrams here. So these are the diagrams that you would uh, uh, compute to find the vacuum energy of Yang Mills, something you don't normally do, but uh, uh, in any case, they are an example of uh, something. So uh, for example, this diagram over here was when it was written for a gluon, something like that. And we replaced the gluon by this double line to make a fat graph. The purpose of doing that is because once you have a double line, you can immediately count the factors of n. And that's because each closed loop is an index loop. Remember, the propagator had these uh, uh, matrix indices on it. So each closed loop identifies all the matrix indices that went around the loop and then sums over them. It means there, there always is one left to sum. So each is a factor of n. So a diagram like this is uh, like m, n squared. And then here's some other examples and these are all of order n squared. The way you get that is by counting the index loops. So here there is more than two. There's, uh, there's actually uh, uh, one, two, three index loops. And there's some factors of the Yang-Mills coupling constant. So for example, this diagram goes like G Yang Mills to the power of the number of three point vertices. Remember a three point vertice was like G Yang Mills. So it was weighted that way. So here it appears squared. And then there are three of these index loops. So it's N cubed. And the way you make this to be of order N squared then is to combine G Yang Mills squared with the power of N like so and call this some different parameter, the tooth coupling lambda, and then you say this is of order n squared. And if you do that systematically, it should always work. So here's, a few, here's another example where we have lots of uh, vertices. We have four three-point vertices. So we have G Yang Mills to the fourth from them. One, two, three, four. And then we have a four-point vertex and remember that one went like G Yang Mills squared. And then the index loops, we have one, two, three, four, and then this one around the exterior is n to the fifth. And then if you identify lambda in the same way as up here, as G squared times n, that uses up a few n's. This is equal to lambda cubed, right? G to the sixth is g squared cubed. Three of the n's are gone to make lambda cubed, and this is also n squared. Okay, all of these diagrams are called planar diagrams. In fact, they're all the th ones that uh, you find at the leading order of large n. Here I've drawn an example of one that doesn't go like that. It actually goes like n to the power zero. And you can see that by the same counting. So it has four uh, three-point vertices. So G Yang Mills to the fourth power. But then the index loops you have to be a little bit careful with. There is one around the outside. And then the stuff on the inside is actually just one big uh, wound up loop that you could get anywhere by following it. So there's only a factor of n squared here. And that turns out to be lambda squared without an n. And so that's n to the power 0. The difference between the diagrams over there and this one is that this one is called non-planar. Non-planar means you can't draw it on a plane without crossing lines. Indeed, you see this line crossed in the center here uh, uh, would be difficult to get on a plane. Now, actually, these vacuum diagrams, it's not really a plane I should be talking about. It should be a sphere. And uh, it's for the following reason. 
I want to think of these index loops as faces of a triangulation of something. So here's a face, here's a face, here's faces. But then I also want to count this outside ring all the time. And that can only be a face of the exterior of the diagram. So I should think of these diagrams as being uh, not on a plane, but one point compactified plane, where the exterior is also a face, which means they're really sitting on a sphere. Now here it might look like you could squeeze a sphere underneath this guy, but that's not quite true because the outside exterior of the diagram has also got to be on the sphere. So, uh, so this is one that you cannot draw on a sphere. You actually need a torus. So what's happening here is it's looking like the expansion goes something like this. N, it's N squared if it's a sphere. It's n to the 0 if it's a torus. There's a nice topological number that goes like that. This is kind of a physicist proof. It works for the first two. <laughs> it's called the Euler character. So this is the Euler character of the two-dimensional surface. You can draw these diagrams on without crossing lines. And we'll do a little better than a physicist proof in a moment, but uh, just to show you how it goes and to learn what the, what the uh, 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 objects that we're talking about are. So this looks like this goes like uh, n to the Euler character, where the Euler character is 2 minus uh, 2 times the genus. So as the object gets more complex, the Euler character gets smaller and goes negative. The genus gets higher, and it sort of uh, maxes out at 2. And then if uh, we haven't talked about it yet, but if there happen to be holes in the space, it would be the number of holes here. OK, so just let me say a few things before we do something a little uh, more systematic, what I mean by a hole. Well, these are all vacuum diagrams. What if I wanted something like a two-point function? Well, I can easily make one here. For example, out of this diagram, I can, uh, let me draw it over again so I don't mess up your notes. I could make something that looks like a two-point function. So there's a two-point function that preserves the maximum number of index loops. Clearly, to make a two-point function of the far vacuum diagram, I do have to break an index loop. So I break the one that's on the outside to put on one leg of the two-point function. And then I do further damage here, but it's damage just to the same index loop, so I don't lose any more 1 over n's. So here, I still want to consider this as a face of the diagram. In a sense, uh, the faces will always come with a factor of n. But the exterior here, I no longer want to be a face, because it doesn't have a factor of n. So I think of the exterior as a hole in the Riemann surface. So this diagram is living on a disk rather than a sphere, where the disk is basically the shape of the diagram. The hole is the outside of it. Now, I could have done this either way. Uh, really, over there, the outside and inside are supposed to be equivalent. So I could have aimed these guys inside. And that would give exactly the same thing and the same counting. I could have, however, made the two-point function in a less careful way. I could have done it something like this. Okay, there is what I would call a non-planar two-point function. And what I've done is I've chosen to split off the external lines in a way, which ruins both of the index sums, opens both of these uh, closed index lines. And this manifold, I would say, has two holes in it. One is in the interior here, and one is on the exterior. So this had one hole, and this has two holes. 
let's see if that matches with our counting over there. So if I want these to go something like end of the chi, well, they might or might not because I now have external lines, so things could be a little bit different. But let's just see. So this I could still draw on the plane, but there's one hole in there. So chi should be 2 minus 1. And in fact, if you count up the index loops, it is exactly n to the power 1. Here there are two holes, so chi should be 2 minus 2. Right? It's still gene is 0. And in fact, if you count the index loops, there aren't any. It's still or n to the 0. In other words, the number of faces has decreased. But that's not quite the correct counting because, of course, I have a few vertices here. There are two of them. And if I want to put these together to make lambda, that will further reduce the n's. It'll absorb this n and make a lambda. What that means is my final formula will depend on the, as well as the Euler character of the surface, it depends on the number of external lines. Okay, so I have to be a little bit more careful. Now, looking through review papers on ADS-CFT, I never see people talk about external lines. Uh, So that led me to make a little bit of uh, effort to derive a formula for the powers of n that you get with a diagram with external lines. OK, so So I think I'd written this last time. Let's define a few things about the generic uh, Feynman graph. So let me call f the number of faces, which is the number of index loops that appears in it, just by definition. Then it should have some vertices. Let's say there are V3 three-point vertices. And V4 four-point vertices. The internal lines inside the graph, like these, I will call E. So E is the number of internal lines. And then there should be some external lines, presumably, if I want to make graphs like this. So I'll call this epsilon the number of external lines. So the coefficient that goes in front of the Feynman integral that you still have to do. Of course, the integral is a hard part. We're just doing the easy part here. The coefficient that goes in front of it comes from these numbers. So there should be an n to the number of faces. Those are index loops. Then we should have a power of G Yang Mills. One of them for each uh, three-point vertex. And then there's G Yang Mills squared for each four point vertex. And that's the coefficient. So we would like to simplify this. To do that, I need to derive some formulas which relate these things. And actually, these formulas are rather easy. One of them is the Euler character, which is related to the number of faces. Just let me make sure I get the sign of it right here. So 
So the Euler character of a graph is equal to the number of faces minus the number of edges, which are the internal lines in the graph, and then plus the number of vertices. And it doesn't care what kind of vertex. It can be three or four point vertices, or you can generalize it all you want with higher vertices. It just counts the number of vertices, and that's it. So here, that's plus v3, plus v4. So we can use this to recover the Euler character, which will go here, because you can see you can use this formula to eliminate f in favor of an n here, and then a bunch of other stuff. And then there are a few other formulas that we need. Uh, one of them, I'd like to define the number of loops in a graph. So these are one loop. What, what do I mean by loops? Well, the obvious thing, it has a loop in it. Uh, but there's a more formal definition of a loop. A loop is if you write the Feynman diagram uh, in momentum space, you associate momenta with all of the internal lines. And there's a momentum conserving delta function at each vertex. You use the momentum conserving delta function to constrain the momenta of the internal lines. That uses them all up except for one, which is the overall momentum conservation of the graph. OK, so the number of internal lines minus the number of vertices plus 1 is what I call the number of loops, <coughs> the number of momentum integrals that remain. And it is, if you look at the graph, just always the number of loops in the graph. Might not be that easy to see in a really complicated one, but like here, it is indeed one integral that would remain. So the number of loops is equal to the number of external lines, pardon me, the number of internal lines, E minus the number of vertices, right, because each vertex is a momentum conserving delta function. And then that doesn't quite get rid of them all because there's an extra uh, overall momentum conserving delta function that must survive. So it doesn't quite subtract all of these. There's one left. So you could try this out if you like. Uh, the diagram over there that I erased, which was like this, it has, well, actually, this is okay. It has zero vertices. It has an internal line, actually. I'm not sure this might be an exception. Uh, okay, let me, let me go to this diagram. Oh, this diagram is better. So it has two internal lines and it has two vertices. So this number is two, and these numbers add up to two. They cancel, and that leaves one loop. Uh, for vacuum diagrams, it act should actually work probably beyond this one. This might be a special case in all this county. Uh, this is an internal line. Uh, there are no vertices. And you add one, it would tell you this is two loops, and it's not, it's one loop, right? So, so this, one doesn't, this one doesn't follow the formula, but any more complicated one has to, actually. Uh, this is one loop, but, but e, e is an internal line. <laughs> I would call E an internal line here. Uh, the vacuum diagram is a little bit subtle because the overall momentum conserving delta function is actually a power of the space-time volume in front. Right, so uh, the vacuum diagrams are maybe a subtlety in this county, uh, although I think when, once you have some vertices in them, they're not. No, I don't want to do it that way. Remember, I wrote the Lagrangian with Giang mills in front of the vertices and not in front of the Lagrangian. So there are two ways to do it. For loop counting, actually, with the Giang mills squared in front of the Lagrangian is a good way to do it. But for counting large n, it's not so good, especially with external lines. 
It's better to do it the old way with G Yang Mills in front of the interactions. Okay. And then there's a third identity, which is just a combinatorial one. It says that a three point vertex emanates three lines, four point vertex four lines, an internal guy two, external one one. And there should be some overall accounting of the number of lines in the diagram. And that gives you a, a formula like, uh, like this one, that the number of external lines plus 2 times the number of internal lines is equal to 3 times the number of 3-point vertices plus four times the number of four-point vertices. Okay. So this emanates four lines, this one three lines, this absorbs two of them, and the rest have to be external. Okay, so with these three formulas, we can then massage this expression up here. So use the first one to eliminate the faces in terms of chi, and keep n to the power chi, and then use the other ones to, uh, say, eliminate V3 and V4 in terms of the number of loops. So I'll make a long story short and write you the result, but it's just some trivial algebra to see that that works. So the formula that you get at the end of the day is that that thing equals lambda where lambda is g y yang mills squared times n by definition, the so-called Tuft coupling. <coughs> so it equals lambda to the power of the number of loops plus external lines divided by 2 minus 1. And then n to the power of the Euler character and then minus the number of external lines divided by 2. Okay. So for a fixed number of external lines, this is what you learn from this formula. N still governs the topology of the uh, two-dimensional surface that you can draw the graph on without crossing lines. And lambda controls the number of loops. Right? So the number of actual index loops, the complexity of the Feynman integral that you have to do in order to get the answer, is still controlled by lambda, like a loop, uh, uh, loop counting uh, parameter. So if you take the large n limit of your Yang Mills theory, that will emphasize diagrams where the factors of n are maximal. That means this Euler character should be maximal for any number of external lines. So let's think about it first with no external lines. In that case, like we were drawing over there in the examples, the maximum Euler number is that of the sphere. If you have some external lines, then the maximum Euler number, well, the external lines have to go somewhere. But as we saw in the example of the two-point function, they can all go into the same face. So we can define that face that they all go into as a whole in the manifold on which we draw the sphere. And that means the maximum chi, Euler number, is equal to 1. So the diagrams that dominate the large n limit 
are ones that can be drawn on manifolds of this Euler number. This is a sphere. Well, this is a sphere with a hole in it. Or you could put the hole at infinity, if you like, and call it the plane. And so this limit of yang mills theory where these are emphasized is, a, is, emphasized is often called the planar limit. And as an example of the last thing that I said, if you really take the, the uh, and put, draw a picture of it, so say we have a vacuum diagram, Well, let me make one that's not so trivial, say like this. Okay, so there's a vacuum diagram, and we want to attach. So this one can be drawn on the sphere, no problem. If, the, if we want to go the planar limit, well, I have to uh, attach external lines. If I want to attach external lines, I mess up the fact that it can be drawn on the sphere, but I could attach them all, say, coming to the face that's on the exterior of this. And then that, you would say, is a di diagram that can be drawn on the plane. The plane being a big disk where, you know, since this is the boundary of the disk. Okay, so that's the chi equals 1. And so in the planar limit, you get a counting where uh, chi equals 1 for stuff with external lines. Uh, here. And chi equals 2 for the vacuum diagram. Now, truncating young yang mills theory to the planar limit, well, it's a beautiful idea, which was uh, basically invented by Tuft uh, a long time ago, in 1976. One might think would simplify it. Actually, the idea here was to make, uh, to rewrite the perturbative expansion of yang mills theory as something that looks stringy. And in fact, the large n approximation does that because if you say take uh, an amplitude with a certain number of external lines, you would sum over all Feynman diagrams. If you rewrite the sum this way, you could think of it as a sum over all topologies of the Feynman diagrams. And then the factor of n that goes with them. And then after that, a sum over diagrams with a given topology and as many internal loops as you would like. And then factors of lambda that go with them. And then, of course, the Feynman integrals. And this looks something like that expansion that we were talking about in string theory. If you identify n as 1 over the string coupling. Of course, we don't have an area law here. Although we do have some sort of a power expansion uh, in the number of loops. and. Uh, there are models uh, uh, incredibly simplified models of yang mills theory where in fact you do sort of think of that as an area right you, you think of uh, one of the uh, one of the internal loops uh, as being an area or or as uh, being a unit of area so this is indeed something like e to the log lambda times the, the area so in some sense, there is even a slightly closer analogy to the stringy appro approximation to an amplitude. Okay, so this was long taken as one other bit of uh, circumstantial evidence that Yang Mills theory has something to do with a string theory, or string theory has something to do with the Yang Mills theory. Uh, <coughs> however, even the leading planar limit has a lot of Feynman diagrams still. So it's a highly non-trivial dynamical system still. And in fact, uh, beyond two dimensions, 
had no solutions. The solution uh, of even the leading order was not known until ADS-C of T came along. And in that case, it uh, is actually known in the large lambda limit, at least for a few special cases. All right, so that's what I had to say about large N. Uh, I've used half an hour, right? I don't remember when I started. I've used half an hour. Okay, good. Uh, Are there any questions about it? Yes. Why is it? Well, for this reason that uh, you could put all of the external lines into one face. Right, so you can draw a graph with any number of external lines uh, on, a, on a diagram that is planar. And chi equals 1 is the Euler character of the plane. No, they're, they're independent, actually. So uh, for a given genus surface, you have a, still have an expansion to all loop order. And in fact, this lambda controls the, that expansion. Right? If lambda is small, uh, you can truncate the expansion in a few orders. You can approximate perturbatively. Uh, on the stringy side, actually, lambda will be large. Other questions, please? Well, let me see. Let's let's make one. So there's a tadpole. Right? It has a factor of n and it has a factor of g yang mills from the vertex here. And so I would write it as square root of lambda times n to the half. And I think it agrees with that formula. Uh, well, I don't think so because I, I think you have to take into account the external lines are sort of special, right? So there's some factors of n and lambda which are fixed by the number of external lines. It'll be external lines on the string amplitudes, so scattering amplitudes. It's basically the same com comparison. So. Yeah. yeah. So in the, in a string amplitude, you just fatten this up to a string, and you know, it's the same uh, the same genus. Uh, the Association of string couplings with external lines is just a normalization thing, I think. I'm not sure. I haven't thought through whether somehow with vertex operators you actually get coefficients like that. But at this point, you can think of it as just a normalization. Yeah. Other questions? OK. So now I wanted to proceed to the guts of ADS CFT and go through the original derivation, the, 
so-called hand-waving derivation, which to this day really rem remains the, the reasoning behind it. There really isn't anything better yet. Uh, there might be some special cases where there's something better, like lower dimensions, ADS3, and so on. But uh, for the one of interest here, which is uh, ADS5 and N equals 4 supersymmetric Yang Mills theory, there really isn't anything better than the original argument so far, which, which is interesting in itself. And how the argument goes is to begin by studying a state of n coincident d3 brains in the type uh, 2b superstring theory. Okay, so d brains are objects on which uh, open strings are allowed to begin and end. And that's almost all we need to know about them here, except a few, well, there are a few other small technical facts. For a D-brain, odd dimensional D occur in type 2B string theory, even dimensional Bs in type 2A, and that's because of the Ramond Ramond uh, uh, form fields that occur in the two theories. In a sense, what they are is like generalized vector potentials that couple to the charges of the brains, and the forms have different dimensions in the two theories, one even, one odd, and so that's why that part of it. But we want a fairly specific state of the string theory, one with a bunch of, well, infinite, flat, parallel, coinciding D3 brains. Okay, so they should look something like this in the 10 dimensions. They should fill a time dimension, and then they should fill three space dimensions. So if these are Cartesian dimensions, they simply fill them completely. And then in the other dimensions, they sit at a point. So the X's are dimensions where they spread out and cover the entire dimension. O's are where you go along that dimension and you encounter the brain as if it were a point object somewhere. So immediately you can say something about the symmetries. These four dimensions include time, so you should have Poincaré invariance just from the embedding. This Poincaré invariance will actually be enhanced by scaling symmetry, which means it will turn into conformal symmetry. And in fact, it'll even turn into conformal supersymmetry at some point. So at some point, it should become the conformal group of four dimensions, SO42. These guys. Well, there look like there are six directions in which you can go away from the stack of D3 brains. So if you suppress the stack of D3 brains, 
these three dimensions and just think of them sitting at a point, so you can't see these three dimensions, what does it look like? It looks like a point charge, maybe just sitting at the origin, not moving. So that, you have a point charge sitting here, the physics around it has a rotation symmetry. If it's sitting here, it's SO2. If it's sitting in these six, uh, with these six extra uh, dimensions, it should be SO5. All right. Well, three dimensions is SO3, yes, so SO6. Good, good. I was worried there for a moment that we had reinvented. <laughs> okay, so you can say something about the symmetries. Furthermore, they're supersymmetric, and I'm not going to develop the technology to know much about that here, but they turn out to be half BPS, which means that the existence of the brain itself uh, preserves half of the supersymmetries of the type 2b string theory. So the number of supersymmetries of 2b is 32. The brain configuration uh, preserves 16 of them. We will have it eventually. <laughs> You're not supposed to be able to know that you have it from looking at the diagram as it is. Uh, there is a UN somewhere, that's right. Uh, but it's not part of this. I'm thinking of the space-time symmetries here. And those are just Poincaré, this rotation group. And then somehow mysteriously, if you also have scale invariance in Poincaré, it will get promoted to uh, this full conformal piece, which is incidentally uh, like an analytic continuation of SO6, very similar. Okay. Half of the supersymmetries, actually that should start an alarm bell ringing in your mind, because, I don't know, maybe you thought that ADS CFT, the dynamics of these brains should have the same number of supersymmetries as type 2b superstring, right? The low energy stuff is Yang Mills and it should be the same number. And that will happen also with this enhancement, right? So you go down to 16 supersymmetries, then somehow it manages to become scale invariant and conformally symmetric and then the conformal superalgebra has these other 16 so-called S generators, right? These are usually called Q, the Poincaré ones, it has the S generators. So once you have conformal symmetry, the supersymmetry algebra actually doubles again. So no, it comes back, yes? We're talking about string theory on these dimensions. It's not really scale invariant. It has a string tension and so on. So, uh, right. That, that's why this one is kind of special. But this will uh, be an emergent symmetry in a low energy limit, in a sense. That's why you're not supposed to know it happens just from the diagram. But out here, no, it's not really scale invariant. It's, uh, it's string theory. String theory has a string tension and all these massive levels and stuff like that. It, uh. Okay. So this sort of configuration we're going to describe in two ways. One is weak coupling. And weak coupling, I guess, is fairly obvious what that means. And the other is going to be strong coupling. So weak coupling, 
string theory I hope you've been learning about in your other lectures. Right? So turn the coupling down, turn the coupling off, in fact. So you just have free strings. So what kind of strings do you have in this 2B theory? They're a super string, and there's a bunch of D brains. So let me try to draw D brains. I'm the world's worst artist, so. Okay, so here's the stack of D brains. They're supposed to be on top of each other. But. And you have two kinds of strings in this theory. Right? 2B is a closed string theory. So there are closed strings floating around out here. And then with brains, there are also open strings. And what they do is they go from D brain to D brain. Well, there might be something like that. A bunch of open strings. Of course, if you really turn the, cup, the string coupling off, then they don't talk to each other. There's just some theory of strings here and theory of strings there. Uh, we might not want to turn it off exactly because that would leave us with a trivial theory. But we could make it weak, weak enough so you can trust uh, string perturbation theory. Okay, so you might have learned about free strings. I don't know if you've yet learned about string perturbation theory. But luckily, we don't really need it here for this hand-waving argument because we will never actually do a calculation. All we really need is to sort of understand what this theory looks like when the string coupling is weak. So the string coupling is usually called G string, and it's the propensity for strings to join, <laughs> join and uh, to split and join. Right? That's how strings interact. Well, it's just like particles interact that way. Their world lines split into multiparticles and field theory and so on. And so that should be the string coupling constant. There's another constant in string theory called the string tension. Right? And uh, actually, those two constants are really the only ones in the, in the superstring. Everything else is determined dynamically. And in fact, even this string coupling comes from uh, dilaton. So it's almost parameter free, but any, in any sense, we have these two. So in the first case, we would like to make the interactions weak. Making this small is enough to make some of the interactions weak. Right? The tendency of these to join and split, that means of these open and closed strings to talk to each other. Making this small makes these small. Also, the open strings here to join and split Right? Making G string small almost makes it small. It's not quite like that because there are N of these D brains. And so sometimes in some amplitudes, you can get a factor of N because you have to sum over the ways that things can happen. And so the actual parameter that you might want to make small to make sure everything is small is G string times N. <coughs> so this weakly coupled string theory I think of something like that. Okay, so turning off GS times N should give us tree level string theory. Tree level string theory is still uh, fairly non trivial. For example, if I ignore this guy, uh, what are these things? Uh, well, they're still open strings. So they have an infinite tower of quantum fields in their spectrum. The masses of those quantum fields are like 1 over the square root of alpha prime. And we would like to simplify that limit. And we do that by taking the low energy limit. Low energy limit is one where the masses of these tower of fields are very large. So the low energy limit you should think of in an active sense in that we restrict our resolution or our ability to interact with the system 
so that our interactions uh, where we we cannot we cannot get together a violent enough interaction to uh, to create a massive state of the string. So, so we simply restrict our probes to be weak, low energy, and then we basically focus on the massless states of the string. And even for those massless states, uh, you might know that the effective action for the zero modes of the string, zero modes are gauge fields, the effective action is some born infield action. We really want to restrict ourselves to energies where the born infield action truncates to the first order in its Taylor expansion, which is Yang Mills. Okay, so here at low energy, I'm running out of room here. At low energy, these fields should be described by uh, Yang Mills theory. Well, it's not exactly Yang Mills theory because this is a super string theory. So the zero modes of open strings do have gauge fields in them, but then they have all the super partners of the gauge field. You have to fill out the whole super multiplet. And actually, this uh, Yang Mills theory, together with all the super partners you get, is n equals 4 super Yang Mills theory. So that's what these things describe. What are these guys? Well, we turn off their interaction. We take a low energy limit. They really turn into free gravitons floating around outside. Right? The lowest uh, energy states of the closed string are graviton supermultiplet. They interact with G string. So G string is in the Newton constant in 10 dimensions. But as well as uh, G string, there are a bunch of factors of alpha prime. This Newton constant is dimensionful. And so if you go to really low energies, you basically turn off all of the interactions, uh, doubly so, and you have a bunch of uh, free strings. In particular, they don't talk to these guys either. So this system has two components, n equals 4 super Yang Mills theory here, and then the string floating here. N equals 4 super Yang Mills theory turns out to be a super conformal gauge theory. So in some sense, the space-time symmetry of this side has been enhanced from Poincaré to SO24. And in fact, it's supersymmetries, it's supersymmetric. Also, the supersymmetry algebra becomes the super conformal one. OK, so that's the weak coupling side. What about strong coupling? Well, strong coupling is a bit more complicated. Well, not really. Uh, it was the insight of Polchinski in the middle 1990s, or maybe early 1990s, so already quite a while ago that some of the solutions of 10-dimensional supergravity, namely the black D-brain solutions, actually are the same state of the string theory as things something like this. The reason why they look different, these are just solutions of supergravity, in a sense the effective field theory as described by string theory, the reason why they look different is because they're in a different limit. So they're reliable solutions, but not in the limits that we took here to talk reliably about this thing. In fact, they're good in a different limit where the string coupling is actually large. There's supergravity in a low energy limit. So over here, before you even start thinking about them, you should think about low energy because you want to truncate string theory down to supergravity. So you look at string theory on 10-dimensional spacetime, and uh, you ask what is low energy limit should be like. So there's 2D <coughs> superstring in this low energy limit. 
should look like 10 dimensional supergravity. So this is not, this is the supergravity action. So the string tension appears here in the Newton constant. And then it's a 10 dimensional field theory. which has various fields in it. And uh, so here I'm writing the bosonic fields of the, of the supergravity, the Ricci curvature. Uh, phi is called the diliton. And this is in the so-called string frame. Uh, the diliton could be absorbed into the metric to get a different, slightly different expression. And then there's a sum over the field strengths of the p-form gauge fields. And uh, P's are odd for type 2B and even for type 2A. So we're interested in odd ones. And so this is uh, the effective action that describes this at low energy. And then, of course, this has a solution like a black D3 brain, which I will have to use some space over here to draw. So it has a metric that looks like this. It has some uh, so-called blackening function. This will have the same symmetries that our stack of D3 brains had. So here is Minkowski space, four-dimensional Minkowski space. So this is a Poincaré invariant bit. And then there's uh, a radial direction, which is really the radius in the other directions, the other six directions. Okay, so it looks like this. So this is a Euclidean metric in these other six directions. This is the radius, which is, uh, uh, I hope it's right. <coughs> okay, so this is the metric field. Uh, the diliton for this solution is a constant. And then one of these uh, gauge fields is excited. And it's the one in the middle of the spectrum, the phi form, which is self-dual. So it has to be uh, projected onto its self-dual part. So it looks something like this. So the blocking the function appears here. And this is a phi form in the r direction as well as x0 to x4. And then h of r, maybe in this spot, h of r. is equal to 1. And then all of the length-dependent stuff is in this factor L, which I'll write as L squared 
Okay, the root should be L to the fourth over R to the fourth. And L just comes from, well, the only dimensional parameters over here is the Planck length, or I should say the Newton constant, and it basically derives from there. Uh, and the fact that this phi form has n units of uh, flux emanating from the D3 brains, so through a phi sphere that links the D3 brains. Uh, and so this is 2, sorry, not 2, 4, 4 pi G string times n. You've typed alpha 4 here, L, L to the 4th, so alpha prime square. Okay, so it looks something like that. Okay, so this is the black D3 brain solution. It has a Ramond Ramond charge. And I guess the Polchinski insight was to identify this Ramon Ramon charge with, in a sense, the charge of a perturbative D brain. So this is only seen, this charge, when you crank up the coupling constant. And it looks something like this. Okay, so I've gone on for an hour. Maybe I can give you a break now, and we'll come back and discuss these two some more. in however many minutes your canonical break is. Okay, so uh, let's begin so at least I get through this stuff today. Uh, so a few questions uh, during the break. Maybe I could clarify for everybody. So this, we haven't said why yet. Okay, we will in a moment. This is low energy super string theory, which is super gravity, and I've only written the bosonic part here. That over there is an exact solution of this theory. Right? This supergravity theory, it's an exact classical solution. What the solution has, well, it's like a black hole. It's like an extremal black hole. So the event horizon is shrunk down to r equals 0. And it's extremal because it's charged. Right? So this phi form carries a charge. Supposed to integrate it on a phi sphere that links the brain. So remember, there were six directions that you could go away from the brain in. You make a sphere in those six dimensions and you integrate F on that sphere, then the number of quanta of charge inside should be this parameter n, which in the classical theory, I guess, has no reason to be an integer even. Uh, but in the quantum theory, there are some reasons to quantize it. Some, some, uh, the same reason why Dirac's monopole quantizes electric charge, some quantization condition like that. Okay, so this is an exact solution of this classical theory. But of course, the theory we're talking about here isn't really classical. It just has this lower energy limit. And so it has fluctuations in it. And those fluctuations should be under control. And that's what will give us this condition. The way you get the condition is you look over here, and the length scale in the solution here is this number L. So the number L gets its form from the fact that this has to have n units of flux. And then the dimensionful parts of this L to the fourth come from the Newton constant over here. So somehow those things work out so that this is the one parameter, dimensionful parameter of, uh, uh, of this solution. And again, you want this to be a low energy limit of string theory. So you want this L to the fourth to be such that uh, 
the mass of modes of the string aren't participating here. So it should be, say, much smaller than the inverse string tension, which would be alpha prime squared. Okay, so this is just a consistency requirement that our classical theory really is classical and isn't somehow polluted by the higher modes of the string. Okay. And of course, this inequality, if you cancel the alpha prime squared, is just that 4 pi g string n is, sorry, not much less than, not much less than. That would be a disaster. <laughs> much greater than, right? So the, in a sense, the size of the solution, the variations in the magnitude of the solution should all be on a scale much longer than the length of a string. So the length of the string is root alpha prime and L is the dimensional parameter that tells you how fast things vary here, right? So L, so this should be much, this should be completely smooth at the length of a string, and that gives us this condition, right? So the decoupling of the mass of modes of the string is this condition. Now, there is actually another condition here. So we've decoupled the modes of the string, but that's not the only thing that can happen because this is a quantum theory. And we wrote the classical action, but we really here are talking about a solution, a classical solution of the action, which is the action for a quantum theory. In other words, even if we throw away the mass of modes of the string, this is quantum gravity. Right? So you want the fluctuations from quantum gravity to be weak. And they will be weak. That gives us another limit where the Planck length, in a sense, should be uh, much smaller than the size of the object. And I've absolutely run out of places to write here. So let me put it here. So I would like uh, L this length on which the solution varies to be much bigger than the 10 dimensional Planck length. And that just like, well, quantum gravity seems to be turned off in this room. That's because we're much bigger than the Planck length. Uh, that should turn off quantum gravity in this system. And if you work it through, well, L Planck has these alpha primes and so on uh, in them. It's a little more complicated than that, actually, because there is also a string coupling here from, from this constant piece. Uh, I do have the exact formula here somewhere. L Planck in 10 dimensions is equal to 1 half times 2 pi to the 7th g string squared alpha prime to the 4th, all that stuff to the power 1 8. So this combined with some g string squared from this stuff, g string to the minus 2, should be something like Planck length to the 8th. And that looks roughly like that. This L is the stuff over there. And so this inequality basically gives us that some numbers times n to the quarter is much bigger than 1. So it's on this side that we actually need large n to turn off quantum gravity. And it's only when quantum gravity turn, is turned off that this is a reliable solution of the theory. Okay, so that's what we have over here.
Okay. Uh, And the idea is that this description, the black brain description, is describing exactly the same state of the superstring theory where you've taken uh, this coupling constant and moved it from something near zero up to something that's large. And coincidentally, the something at lar that's large only really makes sense in the large n limit. Back here, the large n limit is the limit of a large number of these d brains. Well, if these two describe the same theory, in some ways, if you look at the fluctuations about them, you can divide them into two. On the weak coupling side, that was easy. There are these closed strings floating around, which are basically gravitons, not interacting with each other or anything else much, and, and these open strings that connect the brains. On this side, there are two ways to have low energy states. This is an asymptotically flat metric. That means way out at infinity, near r equals infinity, it's basically flat space, and you could have gravitons floating around out there. We're studying this in a low energy limit. Well, actually, it's the large n limit that uh, decouples the gravitons from each other. You have some, uh, basically, the fields in the supergravity multiplet, wi which are more or less behaving like free fields, way out near the infinity, r equals infinity in this solution. The other way to get something low energy is to look near the event horizon, near r equals zero. Well, that's because this is a big attractive potential well, so low energy states could also exist down in there. So these would be the excitations of gravity, of the gravitational theory, supergravity, to begin with, in the near horizon geometry of the black D3 brain. So that near horizon geometry you get by making R really small compared to L. So this H of R turns into L to the fourth over R to the fourth. When you stick it into here, what you get is the following metric. <coughs> Which is basically the metric of ADS5 cross S5. So, a miracle has happened on, uh, actually on both sides. In this ADS5 cross S5 metric has more symmetry, right? It's uh, in a sense a more symmetric part of the space-time than the generic uh, point in the space-time. In that it's uh, acquired the, basically the anti disitter anti symmetry, the symmetry of ADS5, which is again like the conformal algebra, SO24. On the other weak coupling side, it's the n equals four super Yang Mills theory that lives here, which has this enhanced symmetry. So somehow some symmetry comes back into the game uh, that, that wasn't actually there just for the D brain construction. And in a sense, you can think of it as like going to a fixed point in a dynamical system. Fixed points can often have more symmetry, can be more symmetric, in particular have scale, scale symmetry, uh, where the generic uh, dynamic of the system doesn't. Okay, so there's an enhancement of the symmetry here due to the low energy limit. On this side, because it's a superconformal field theory, 
And on this other side, because you're looking at the piece of the geometry that has the same enhanced symmetry. So the degrees of freedom, the other low energy degrees of freedom here, are basically gravitons floating around in this near horizon geometry. So it was the insight of Maldacena that identified these two. They said this piece has two kinds of excitations, these, which are just decoupled supergravitons, and this stuff. And on this side, the decoupled supergravitons that live near infinity, and then the stuff that lives near the horizon, which should be supergravitons living in this metric. The idea is those are exactly the same degrees of freedom, but it's not quite the end of the story because the duality is not between n equals 4 super Yang Mills theory and just supergravity. It should have the entire 2B string spectrum in it somehow. And so the idea then is that you could go to a small enough radius that actually you can recover the entire type 2B string theory. Uh, that's just a scaling argument where you can make R small enough that it can compete with the alpha prime states, uh, the stuff that you've thrown away, and recover the entire string. And you might wonder that uh, if you're looking at such high energy states that you bring back alpha prime exciting string states, that they might back react on the geometry and change this nice scheme. And that part, I believe, I've never seen it written somewhere, but it's my belief, uh, that part actually works because this ADS space is thought to be an exact solution of type 2B supergravity, even at the quantum level. So in some sense, it's uh, partially supersymmetric. And all of the quantum corrections to this supergravity coming from integrating out stuff higher up in the string spectrum, so stuff that will be suppressed by alpha prime, higher curvature terms, and so on, all of those things actually are supposed to vanish when evaluated on this solution. <laughs> and that's why in the near horizon geometry, you, you can get back the entire spectrum of the type 2b superstring. So then the duality is type 2b superstring theory living in this geometry and the uh, analogous limit of the uh, five form flux. So ADS5 cross S5 with n units of flux through the phi sphere is exactly dual to the low energy stuff here, which is n equals four super Yang Mills theory. And they both come with this re-enhanced symmetry. So here you have the whole type 2B string, so it has all the supersymmetries of the 2B string theory. Uh, and, uh, and here the enhanced symmetry comes from the superconformal extension of the Poincaré symmetry of the, D of the D3 brains. Okay. Uh, so the discussion here, in a sense, tells you that the degrees of freedom down here are gravitons in this geometry. But actually, if you lower r, you can excite higher energy states. And it's just a scaling argument, which I haven't given you, but there is a fairly simple scaling argument that tells you if you go to a small enough radius, where here this geometry actually doesn't change, you just go to a smaller radius, uh, you could recover the entire st string spectrum. And you might worry that the higher states of the string having a lot of energy would back react and change the geometry. And I believe that does not work because this geometry is actually an exact solution of the full superstring theory. So if you included the higher states of the string in the effective action here, you would have terms with alpha prime times all kinds of higher curvature stuff, 
right? If this wasn't just a low energy effective action, but uh, something that you got by integrating out the, the, the mass of states, uh, an effective action for bosonic fields of higher energies, you get a bunch of uh, corrections to this, and those corrections are supposed to vanish when you evaluate them on this solution. So in some sense, the fact that this background is an exact solution of the superstring theory allows you to res restore the entire string spectrum down there. Yeah, it includes everything. Yeah. Of course, you can't do this explicitly, <laughs> these calculations. I, I'm not sure to what extent the, some corrections are known, but uh, the full program uh, uh, one can't really do, but uh, it's basically a symmetry argument that says this is an exact solution. Right? That there basically aren't uh, that since uh, since it's a constant curvature solution, all the higher curvature things basically go away here. That's the idea. Okay, so this is a so-called derivation. And it is a somewhat convincing argument, but probably wouldn't be so convincing without some additional evidence. And by now there's quite a bit of evidence, but let me just go through a list of reasons why you might think this is correct. Okay, so the reason why this strong coupling and this weak coupling solution are solutions of the same theory And even at the enhanced level, the enhanced level means n equals 4 super Yang Mills. Equals the entire string spectrum. And once you have the strings, you might turn back on supergravity. It doesn't have to be in large n limit. So the super Yang Mills theory with any gauge group, any SUN, any value of the coupling is equal to the type 2B string on this background where you identify the radius of curvature of the background with the Tuft coupling. And the n units of flux in the background with the un or sun of the gauge group. They won't matter much to us, although the gauge group is more properly sun than un. Maybe I better write that. Okay. okay, so this is the conjecture that these are exactly equal to each other. Uh, an old time field theorist like me finds this an absolutely fascinating idea. What it tells me is that a uh, one kind of observer, like us, whose only tools are particle accelerators, kind of crude, might see this world as uh, Yang-Mills theory. Highly supersymmetric, conformal asymmetric Yang-Mills theory. Not sure how we would see that kind of a world. Uh, we would be rather strange objects in there, because uh, we would all have all different sizes, for example. Uh, but anyway, one observer sees the world that way. And another guy equipped with some other experimental apparatus. I don't imagine what that is, but some other apparatus sees the world as not 
four-dimensional and not garden variety Yang Mills theory, but as a ten-dimensional world where with quantum gravity turned on and where uh, uh, and where the elementary objects are strings. And it's exactly the same world, just two different points of view. So I used to teach in my field course. The course I teach to graduate students. The unique action for quantum electrodynamics is F mu nu squared plus and so on. And the unique action for supersymmetric gauge theory is this. Well, this says it's not true. There's at least two different ways of describing exactly the same dynamical theory. Right? So there's, there's no more uniqueness in the variables that you describe a theory with. OK, so evidence. first piece of evidence is that both sides have the same symmetries. N equals 4 is super conformal and then has a SO6 equals SU4 R symmetry. This solution has SO6, the rotation symmetry here. And then the enhancement of this 4D Poincaré symmetry to the anti-desitter group, which is basically identical to the conformal group. And then there are supersymmetries that go along. And the full supersymmetry on this geometric side also matches the full supersymmetry, uh, which is something like uh, PS... Uh, U two slash two comma two slash four, I think. I, I have it written here somewhere, but I, I won't bother to <laughs> look it up. But the full super algebra together with all with all these bosonic symmetries is this big supersymmetry algebra, and it's the same on both sides. And more than the symmetries being the same on both sides. The objects that are interesting fall into the same multiplets. So you get the same multiplet structure of the degrees of freedom. Then beyond that, There are a bunch of uh, correlation functions which are protected by supersymmetry. And they turn out to be identical. So these are half BPS objects. You can identify half BPS operators in N equals 4 super Yang mills. Uh, The ones that are super conformal primary operators, for example, are, have uh, correlation functions that are protected by supersymmetry. They don't get quantum corrections. I think that was known somehow. Just for, there's an algebraic proof in n equals four that uh, that they're uh, <coughs> the anomalous dimension of these operators aren't aren't there but the dimensions of the operators are somehow quantized. Uh, these operators correspond to actually modes of the supergraviton on the string side. And this fact was used to calculate them using uh, uh, coming from the string side. And in fact, they were found to match exactly. And then there was found that three-point functions also were computed and also found the match exactly. And it wasn't actually known at the time that three-point functions were protected. 
the proof in n equals 4 came after this matching. And it turns out that they are actually protected by supersymmetry, so would have been expected to match. Uh, so that was work that was done early on. So there's a bunch of things that actually turn out to be identical, everything that's protected by supersymmetry. Of course, other things that aren't are not so easy to match. That's because on one side, you compute them at weak coupling. On the other side, you compute them at strong coupling. And so they're, you can't compute them in a domain where, they, where there's overlapping validity, and uh, you could compare them sensibly. OK, and then there are other things, uh, like Wilson loops. And uh, some other operators that you can, uh, uh, whose properties you can compute on the Yang Mill side by localization. The, the topic of one of next week's lecture series. So, those you can compute to all orders in the coupling constant, in a sense, uh, using a localization argument. And uh, I'll review a little bit of that for you, the beginnings of it, uh, not in this lecture, but uh, a little later on. You can compute them on the, on the gauge theory side and extrapolate the strong coupling and compare with what you get from string theory. And almost everything matches. There are a few holdouts. And uh, it's thought that the holdouts are there uh, simply because the technicalities of the calculation aren't, aren't, uh, aren't properly understood. But the easy things do match beautifully. <coughs> and what else? Well, there's a bunch of other qu qualitative things. For example, if you deform the state of n equals 4 in some way, uh, to make a non-supersymmetric and so on. Uh, the properties of the theory that you would calculate using the duality, the equally deformed uh, supergravity side, actually turn out to be more or less, at least qualitatively, what you would expect from a gauge theory. So if you ruin the superconformal symmetry, for example, you might expect the Yang-Mills theory has confinement, and you can actually see evidence for that. Uh, in the solutions, the corresponding solutions on the string theory side. And there are a whole bunch of other things like that. Okay, so this is And then there's actually another thing I should mention, and that's the integrability program. And this is for the planar limit. And it's never really been demonstrated to uh, any degree of mathematical rigor that one can extrapolate from weak coupling to strong coupling using integrability. But there is pr are proposals for integrable models that compute some of the anomalous dimension of a bunch of operators on the gauge theory and uh, match them with string states. There are some extrapolations from weak to strong coupling in this business that are pretty convincing, you know, that fit weak coupling up to five or six loop order, uh, so, uh, and, and match computations on the strong coupling side, which actually on the string side tend to be the more difficult ones here. And these are more or less limited to the planar limit, uh, but I guess you would also have to take as a piece of evidence that the structures on both sides seem to be uh, very, very similar. And of course, they're supposed to be exactly the same. <coughs> OK. So just a few more words about uh, the duality itself, how you're supposed to use it. I just have to get the right. So how would you use it to compute something like a correlation function?
So in the n equals 4 super Yang Mills theory, what do you do actually? So it should be a correlation function of some operators. So something like that. All right, a time ordered product of some operators. Maybe I go to Euclidean space and then time ordering is a little different. So some array of operators, this is supposed to be x2 here. Well, let me assume that these operators are scaling operators. So in the superconformal algebra, there's a dilatation generator. And the so-called scaling operator has a special property in that its commutator with a dilatation generator looks something like this. In other words, if you put it at the origin at x equals 0, so this piece is absent, in a sense it's an eigenoperator of dilatation. The first thing you do is probably the hardest part of it. You have to figure out on the string side what the degree of freedom of string theory is dual to this operator. Symmetry is usually an important guide in doing that. So for example, the supergravitons, it's known what they're dual to. It's the supergraviton multiplet, all of the operators there. It's known uh, which operators on the Yang-Mills side they're dual to. So some of the duality is filled in. The mass of states are more difficult. And I think some are known, but uh, I think many aren't. And in fact, that's one of the open directions in this subject, is trying to understand better what is dual to what exactly. But anyway, some are known, so you identify the string dual. So that's some excitation in string theory. Then at least in these limits where string theory is low energy and classical and so on, you solve string theory. <laughs> okay, well that's a tall order. But of course, you solve it in a semi-classical limit which means you solve uh, classical field equations for some excitation of the background. So it's not a gravitational equation anymore. It's actually just a wave equation for something traveling on the ADS uh, 5 cross S5 background. With a boundary condition, That, well, I should say what the, let's say that, say that's something like this, some kind of scalar field on the background. That this field approaches some fixed value at the boundary of ADS. And the boundary of ADS5, I've erased the metric, but then the metric I'd written is at r equals infinity. So this is the direction away from the horizon, which was at r equals 0, if r was that. But of course, it's not out in the asymptotically flat region. It's where it's still ADS, but you've sort of scaled everything so there is an r equals infinity limit of ADS. So you solve whatever wave equation for your string mode that you have with a boundary condition that it approaches this phi zero. 
There is a subtlety that it usually approaches phi zero times a number which goes to infinity. So we'll deal with that later, but that is often there. Uh, something like uh, r to the power delta. Let's not worry about that for now. And then you... What you do is you calculate the partition function of the string with this boundary condition. And that you identify with a generating functional in Yang-Mills theory, where the function that you put in the boundary, uh, in the boundary condition, this phi zero, is a source function whose functional derivatives give you correlators of the field, which is the Yang-Mills dual of this curly phi. Now, this equation is a little bit schematic because of this renormalization issue. There's often an infinite factor you have to factor out before you come into here. And that is sometimes uh, understood as a kind of a wave function renormalization of, say, a composite operator that you would see here. Now, this is normally done semi-classically, right? The partition function of the string theory, that's also a tall order. But in a semi-classical limit, of course, that's just given by the action of, uh, by the classical action. So this, could be the, the classical action, of uh, perhaps supergravity or corrected supergravity. evaluated on the solution, that is on shell, but on the solution where this mode of the supergravity goes to this boundary <laughs> condition. Okay. So this gives a connection between correlation functions of Yang-Mills fields and the on shell action of supergravity with a certain boundary condition. And the boundary condition is what contains the source function over here for, that you take functional derivatives by on this side to generate correlators. Okay. So I've come to a good place to stop, actually. Uh, next time, what I want to do is talk about, about a bit about Wilson loops. And that's motivated by the fact that I started the discussion last time of uh, the duality with Wilson loop. So we can come back to it and see what, what we've learned uh, what of what we've learned can be applied to it. And so I will do that next time, and then I will come back to correlation functions after that, probably in a subsequent lecture. So, thank you.